Well, let's do it. Shall we do another? Yeah. Great. This is Out of the Dark, an audio series about Dark Hall, a theater built in 1929 in Regina, Saskatchewan. Throughout this series, we are exploring Dark Hall by hearing the stories of people who have been touched by this historic performance space. I am your host, Paul Deshane. Episode 4, A Love of Music. (laughs) Regina alert! On lookout for gang of English outlaws! The entire city of Regina was a hive of activity Wednesday morning. A wire direct from Scotland Yard over the Grapevine Wireless brought news of a planned visit here by England's well-known outlaw, Robin Hood. While Robin Hood is known far and near as somewhat of a jovial rascal who favors the bow and arrow rather than the more deadlier weapons, there is always the possibility that he and his band might have heard of the more modern methods used in this civilized age. Every citizen is asked to cooperate in keeping a careful lookout for Robin Hood or any members of his outlaw band. Report any suspicious characters to Robin Hood Department, Leader Post, Regina. The following official Scotland Yard descriptions are offered with the suggestion that all citizens clip them out and paste them in their hats. Robin Hood, medium height, dark hair, dressed in doublet and hose of green color will be recognized by his nonchalant air that has carried him safely through many dangerous situations. A clever crook. Friar Tuck, short and well-fed, dressed in russet brown, last seen at the north end of Albert Street. Maid Marion, young vivacious type of medium height, short hair, conducts herself as one who is at home in the society of the English nobility. Other names of members in the band are Little John, Will Scarlet, and David of Doncaster. They all wear the doublet and hose so much affected by Englishmen during the reign of King Richard the Lionheart. On account of the rigors of the western climate, it is felt that they may come here attired in more conventional garb. Any and all information will be gratefully accepted. If the outlaw chief and his band are not rounded up in the meantime, they intend to make an appearance at the Dark Hall for four days commencing Wednesday, December 16, in a great stage production called Robin Hood. Following their ancient custom of giving to the poor, all the proceeds of this entertainment will be given to the combined Lieutenant Governor's Emergency Distress Fund and Leader Post Christmas Cheer Fund. Uh, This was an item in the December 9, 1931 issue of the Regina Leader Post, advertising a benefit show of Robin Hood at Dark Hall that was put on by the Regina Federation of Young People. Later that holiday season, the Regina Amateur Operatic Society performed the musical The Toreador, also in Dark Hall, the proceeds from which also went towards the Lieutenant Governor's Emergency Distress Fund. The Leader Post describes the Toreador as distinctly delightful, and said it was performed with all the sparkle and abandon the brilliant Spanish scenes demand. The Regina Amateur Operatic Society is the precursor of what became known as the Regina Lyric Light Opera Society in 1977, and was renamed in 2009 as Regina Lyric Musical Theatre. They made their home at Dark Hall for many years. Edward Willett is a past president of Regina Lyric Musical Theatre and has been a performer in many of their productions. He is also a renowned science fiction and fantasy author who's written more than 60 books. I spoke with him about his experiences performing with Lyric Musical Theatre in Dark Hall. Uh, I'm Edward Willett, and I'm a past president of Regina Lyric Musical Theatre. Uh, I think it was still Regina Lyric Light Opera most of the time I was president of it. And uh, I've also performed in many, many shows with Lyric and other organizations and theatrical groups. And I've also directed a few as well. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to start with Duet for Two Hands, which... Oh, yes. <laughs> you, like, was, that was your first performance with, in Dark Hall? That was the first time I'd ever seen Dark Hall. I was in Weyburn at the time, and I was one of the original members of Crocus 80 Theatre, which was uh, formed by a a fellow named uh, James Hosking, 
Uh, and uh, we started in 1980, as you can tell from the name. And 82, I think it was, I think it was the first time we competed in what was still called the Dominion Drama Festival. I think the national uh, element of that had gone away, but it used to be a national amateur theater competition. But there was still a provincial, and still is, a version of it, a provincial theater a competition for amateur groups. And we did this show called Duet for Two Hands, which was written by uh, Walter Mills, Haley Mills's father. <laughs> and uh, we brought it up here, and the competition was in Dark Hall. And the way the competition worked was you would come in, set up, do the show, tear down, and then next day, while the next group was setting up, uh, you would be adjudicated. So that was my first experience of uh, Dark Hall, and I remember being impressed with it then. Um, I also remember it being a bit run down <laughs> at the time. I think there had been some problems in the basement just before that, and there had been, I don't know, I, I, I don't remember the history, but it, it was already showing some structural problems and things they had to deal with at that point. But it was, it was a great space. I had never been in a theater quite like it. My university didn't have anything quite like it, which is the only other place I'd done theater if you didn't count high school. And uh, it, was, it was a great place to perform. And the only thing I remember about the show was that I was playing a drunken Scottish surgeon, and we didn't bother to do Scottish accents, so I wasn't very Scottish. <laughs> yeah. And the adjudicator said they should find me a comedy to be in because my timing was, was comic, and this was not supposed to be a comedy. But <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> it wasn't a comedy. It wasn't a comedy. It's a, it's a melodrama. Okay. It, it's, about a, it's about a surgeon who sews the hands of a convicted murderer, executed murderer, onto the, uh, um, the arms of a concert pianist <laughs> who has lost his hands in an accident or suffered an accident. Yeah. And the hand, it's, I guess you do, it's almost a horror story, really. The hands kind of take him over and influence him. Right. Uh, it's, it's kind of a strange premise. It must have been written in the 40s or 50s. Um, but it was, it was fun to do. The other thing I remember about it is that because I was a drunk, I drank vast quantities of fluid in, in yeah. every performance. And what he drank was something called whip call, which was supposed to be malted milk and rum. Oh my God. And uh, what we used was just chocolate milk. So I drank vast quantities of chocolate milk in every performance. <laughs> and that, and we did have one Scottish woman in the show with a Scottish accent, and the adjudicator said either, either she shouldn't have done a Scottish accent or we all should have done a Scottish accent. And we had to explain that that's just the way she talks. None of us were doing accents. <laughs> I'm surprised that that wasn't a comedy because that's, the premise sounds comic. It does, but it wasn't intended to be. It was supposed to be more of a gothic thing. Because the other thing he said, our, our set designer had made everything kind of pink. The walls were kind of pink. Right. And the other thing the adjudicator said that I remember is that perhaps drawing room pink was not the best choice for a show about a convicted murderer's hands taking over a concert pianist. Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, I remember all of that. But I remember the theater too. Yeah. <laughs> it was very it was very nice to perform in. For this for, for this performance, um, then it wasn't it wasn't like a minimalist stage. Like if you had like No, this was full 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 set, flats, furniture, the whole bit. Yeah. Right. But you had to like do this all very quickly. Yes, that was part of it. You uh, you would have to you know, you loaded up the trucks, you got it there, you had to set it all up in a few hours and then you had it you had to try to get that done quickly enough so you had a chance to do a run through. Yeah. Because of course the the space is different. You want to see what that's like. And uh, then do the show. And then you go to the, uh, you had to tear it down, I think, yeah, you had to tear it down that night before you went to the reception, wherever that was. I, right. It was in the little theater space, which at that time was over on Saskatchewan Drive. And uh, I remember that too. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it's a very intensive day uh, in these, uh, these competitions. And I was in, with Crocus 80, I was in two or three comp competitive ones, uh, two for sure. Because you didn't get to go every year necessarily, right. um, and yeah, I haven't done it in in Regina because I moved away from the little theater side of things. Although I still I have directed some little theater plays and been in some uh, to the musical side of things. Yeah, that uh, that Dominion Theater competition. Like how how many people competed in that? Like how big is that thing? Well, it had to fit in a week. Right. So it'd be like. I don't know, seven or eight or maybe as many as ten. Right. I don't remember how long it ran. Theater companies. At the time, there weren't that many in Saskatchewan. Right. They ballooned in the 80s, 90s, and the, I don't know what it is. It's now Theater Saskatchewan is now the overall organization, I think. And uh, 
last time I looked, but this was probably 20 years ago, there were 40 or 50 amateur theater companies. So it must be more competitive than ever to get into. We used to hate Regina Little Theater because they seemed to win everything every year. Right. <laughs> big city in there. With, or big city ways. <laughs> Um, okay, so then coming forward, you eventually moved to Regina. 1988. First show was The Music Man with Colin Greer, who of course was well known in Saskatchewan from the afternoon edition, and he was pretty new. I think that was his first show with Lyric, and then for many years he did Lyric shows. Typically he would get the romantic lead, and I would get some sort of character part. <laughs> to drive me crazy. Um, and in that first one, he was playing Harold Hill, The Music Man, and I was playing Charlie Cowell, The Anvil Salesman. And because Charlie Cowell is kind of a little bit of a villain, but he doesn't really participate in many of the musical numbers. Just There's just one sort of rap number, really, <laughs> off the top of the show. Um, but uh, Colin p- punched me in the face and knocked me down, which is a pretty good trick considering I'm quite a bit taller and heavier than he was. But was that an accident? Or was that no, no, that's part of the, that's part of the show. He eventually punches the, this anvil salesman who's kind of right. a sleazy guy. and Yeah, so that was all acting. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't actually meet most of the cast at that point because they were all in the chorus or they were doing these other numbers and I was only in a few scenes. So in a way, I felt a little, still a little distant from, like my future wife was in the show and I uh, was, she was barely aware of me and I was barely aware of her in that This show. wasn't where you met? We didn't make, well, we might have met doing Music Man. We really met because that was when I became involved with the executive. So Margaret Ann, who's now my wife, Margaret Ann Hodges, and me were both recruited at the same time to the board. And uh, that's really where we met, I think, was at uh, Regina Lyric board meetings. Regina Lyric Musical Theater, that, its home was in Dark Hall. That's that where we was. did our spring shows, our okay. big spring shows. Uh, the seat, you know, things have changed over the years, but typically at the time there would be a, it, it has been a brunch more recently, it wasn't necessarily a brunch, but there'd be like a music only show that we would do and that could move around. We did it in the lobby of the Center of the Arts for a long time, Hotel Saskatchewan, ballroom for many, many years, um, and some other places. Um, and uh, then the, we do a big show in the, the spring, which would be a full-scale musical. And that was, from when I got here up until 1999, all those shows were in Dark Hall. And we also did one fall show in there as well. And I did other shows with, um, like, Thai Productions, another group I performed with in Dark Hall as well. So I performed in there a lot. <laughs> You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM CJTR, tuned into the community. Could you just tell me a little bit about what Regina Lyric Musical Theater is? Uh, It was formed, well, it it takes its name from an earlier organization. Regina Lyric Light Opera is what it was when I first, we, we changed the name later because Light Opera has become a term that people don't associate with musical theater, so it became musical theater. Um, and it was just an opportunity, t- or it existed to give opportunities to performers, directors, musical people of all sorts, an opportunity to do musical theater when there just weren't any opportunities to do musical theater. Yeah. Uh, it's the same thing with, you know, little theater. It was to give people an opportunity to do theater who aren't professionals. They might be as good as professionals, but that's not what where their career has gone. Um, and then you're also providing entertainment. And at the time, you know, it doesn't seem like it should be this way. But in the 80s, there was less entertainment around than there is now. You didn't have all this streaming stuff. You couldn't watch Broadway shows at the theater or operas at the theater or anything. And certainly when the original Lyric Light Opera started in the 40s, it was very much that whole Saskatchewan thing of, you know, let's make something happen. Let's put on a show. Right. <laughs> so the current, like, uh, Lyric started, the current version of it had started in 77, I think. So when I got here, it had been going for about 10 years. I was aware of it in Weyburn because I'd see stories in the Leader Post. And I know just before I moved, when I didn't know I was moving yet, uh, they had done the V Parisienne on Operetta. And I thought, boy, that looks like fun. I wish we could do stuff like that here in Weyburn. But in a small town, it's almost impossible to have enough people to do a musical. uh, Adults, anyway. So, uh, I was always aware of it, and uh, I was aware of its mission, and that's exactly what I was interested in because I'd gotten into the whole amateur theater thing, and and theater had been something that I had 
loved since I did Taming of the Shrew when I was 11 years old at Weaver Junior High. So right. played Petruchio. <laughs> yeah. What was your impression of the theater? Like, like you've worked in it for so long. What was your impression of it as a building? Well, as a building, it was great. And the acoustic was good, too. Like, we, we didn't use mics in those days. Uh, almost everybody mics everything now to some extent because people, I think they've lost the ability to listen. Uh, perhaps at some point you were used to hearing live theater without any amplification. Uh, but again, that also depended on the space. Live theater without amplification in the center of the arts. Opera singers did it, but uh, for ordinary people, that's a huge space to fill. Dark Hall was a nice size, had good acoustics, and it had that uh, had a nice ambiance um, with the organ pipes on either side. Uh, the organ uh, console was still there. We may have danced on it at one point. I'm not sure. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, and uh, then it had, you know, just that the wood and the feel of the place and the arching beams overhead. It just felt really nice. And it had, you know, it had the proper theatrical rigging. Uh, for the Music Man, we actually used the old rope rigging. Uh, Philip May was the director, used to be at the uh, conservatory where we are recording this. Uh, taught vo voice here, and I guess he was at the university as well, probably. And we were actually flying in trees and things for the music man using the, the original rigging that was in the building. Um, I don't think we used it again after that. I think that's the only time I remember us actually flying stuff in. But you right. could do that in there, and you can't do that in like in Weyburn where we were performing in the the Catholic Church's community hall, you know, or in the Legion where we had to move the bingo machines out of the way on Thursdays <laughs> so we could do our show. <laughs> uh, so it was really nice to be in a proper theater like that. For Lyric, we used to build out a platform in front of the stage to get us a little closer to the audience. Uh, but we did typically, it varied over the years, but we typically did put the orchestra right in front of the stage. Missing an orchestra pit, which would have been nice, but that's something that Especially if you have a basement, it's really hard to do an orchestra pit in that in there. But it worked really well, and I loved. I always loved to perform in it. The first show I did, which was the Music Man, I was just thrilled to be performing at that level in a show like that, that biggest show with an orchestra and uh, this proper theater. It was just really great. How, how did people come out for musical theater back then? It was usually good. It depended yeah. on the show. And you could never tell. Like, we did the Merry Widow, and they were lined up out into the street getting in, and it was packed. At the time, we alternated between operetta and musical theater. So we'd right. do, like, a Gilbert and Sullivan, and then a musical, and from year to year. That, that went away at some point. We started to run out of operettas. And also, the, op the taste for operetta was kind of fading. Yeah. Although, it wasn't, you know, when we started it, like I said, the Merry Widow was an operetta, and it, it had huge crowds. For many years, I was always in rehearsal for something, it seemed like, yeah. or... Uh, less of that after our daughter was born, you know, you get more involved with that. And uh, that's actually, I, I, and of course, nobody's been doing anything for the last couple of years. I wanted to ask you about uh, the Mikado. Oh, yes. Was that, that was a uh, lyric musical theater again? It was. The Mikado was fun. Um, Robert Erson, who was artistic director, I think at the time, he was artistic director for a few years, but he directed many shows on either sides. So when, when we decided we weren't having an artistic director anymore, he continued to direct shows. Um, but he wanted to make it, you know, Gilbert and Sullivan is a bit like Shakespeare. You can do all sorts of things to it and yet still keep the music and the overall story. So what he did was set it in modern times. And uh, so it was, uh, the town is called, uh, what is the town called? Anyway, he made it a div the division of Phony Corp. So it was like a, not a town, but a company. And it was all, all the jokes were, were updated and everything. And the cast, we had Renee Brad, who's a well-known opera singer. Uh, we had uh, 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 Dion Taylor, who's a nationally known jazz singer now. And we had uh, Paul Nolan, who's a Broadway star now <laughs> in that cast. And we had me, too, so there you go. Um, and, but what was fun about it was, first of all, this setting of it. Uh, there were also some current jokes. So uh, at one point, you know, the Lord High Executioner has a list, and that was Colin Gruber, of course, has this list of uh, people who wouldn't be missed. And one of the ones that he took a dig at was Dwayne Lingenfelter. Uh, as he said, the, the wealthy socialist, he said, <laughs> he never will be missed. <laughs> and that got a big laugh. And we got mentioned in Hansard for that one. So. Really? <laughs> yeah. How, 
In what context? Uh, some M- one of the MPs was there. I don't know which, who it was, and they they had you know whenever they get up and say nice things about different organizations, they mentioned enjoying the show, and I don't remember what they said. Some sort of something about that. Uh, but it was, you know, we got mentioned in Hansard for that one. But the thing I really remember about it was that Paul Nolan, who was graduating from high school that year, was reliant on somebody else, and he lived in Rolo, was reliant on somebody else to drive him to the theater that night after his graduation. And it was probably a kid, and they were late. And so we're waiting, and it's 8 o'clock, and he's not even there. The show's supposed to start at 8 at about 8.10, I think, 8.15, we said, okay, we're going ahead. We started the show. Rob Erson uh, put on, he, uh, it was this yellow leather jacket that Paul was playing Nanky Poo, the, the, the minstrel, and he was a rock star in our show. And uh, he came out, but he, he had rewritten the script, but he didn't have it memorized. So he was doing it book in hand. No, he didn't even have book in hand. He was just out there winging it. And I was on stage with him trying to feed him his lines. Didn't I hear that such and such? Oh, yes, that's right. You know, it was, fortunately, I knew the lines. And then a few minutes of this, very long few minutes, um, Paul made it. He'd been downstairs and had to get, you know, quickly made up and everything. And he walked out on stage and he said, I'll take my coat now. <laughs> and Rob just handed it to him and Paul stepped into the role and we just carried on. Told that story on Paul ever since. I think he's told it himself a few times. <laughs> but uh, There was a technical problem at Dark Hall. Uh, that was Deflator Mouse. Um, huh. In fact, who was I talking to? That came up in conversation just the other day with somebody. Um, it's a three-act deflator mouse. Oh, actually, that was the first show that Paul Nolan, the future Broadway star, was in. He was like a spear carrier. Uh, he was like 14 or something at the time. Um, and uh, just as we were about to start the third act on opening night, the lights went out. And this turned out to have been a major substation failure of the one over by the science center I think if it's I don't know if it's still there or not but there used to be one over there and you know all of Regina was blacked out or the entire half of Regina was blacked out however it worked out and so we waited and it was clear you know you can't wait too long you got audience sitting there in the dark and nothing's happening so finally Rob went out I don't remember how he got lights on and there may have been some emergency lights in the theater there probably were and of course I'd say these days people would hold up their phones but yeah. didn't have that then and he went out on stage and uh, told them what they would have seen in the final act. <laughs> He's funny, uh, but still, it wasn't quite the same. And then we went off to our opening night reception. I think the power came back on somewhere along in there. Too late to do us any good. And uh, it was a very odd opening night reception when you hadn't actually finished the show. And there were people whose main part was in the third act. They had, hadn't even performed to speak of that night. And there they are at the opening night reception. So, yeah, it's the things like that that you you remember quite often is uh, technical problems that actors like to talk about. They don't like them happening, but afterwards they're glad to have the story to tell. <laughs> yeah. You've been involved with theater in Regina for a very long time, very deeply involved with it. So can you just comment on um, the theater community? I don't have much to compare it with because I pretty much lived here, <laughs> except yeah. for Weyburn. And it's larger than Weyburn's uh, theater. But I think it's very, that's quite vibrant I think and, and more so now because there's more groups uh, we've got Sterling Productions now is doing major productions every year uh, and of course Do It With Class Young People's Theater came along and it's now 30 years in or something like that um, and uh, so you're getting all these young people getting involved I think high schools have become more ambitious in what do they do um, on the amateur level Little Theater still going strong summer stage um, and Lyric. Now, I'm not nearly as deeply as, as involved as I was for many years because I'm not on the board anymore. I'm just a performer, and I haven't been performing as often, although I still sing with Lyric Singers quite a bit. And I hope to get back to doing more of it, although, again, I'm really not getting the romantic leads anymore. <laughs> uh, unless it's on Golden Pond or something. Um, and then the, the professional... Company. We have Globe Theater, and we've had people that go back and forth between them, like Marianne Woods is a professional who works on both sides of the aisle. I've done two Globe shows. Uh, Mark Claxton, who's very involved over there, is in a, at least one lyric show. Um, so the there's just a big group of theater people now. I think it's much bigger than it's ever been, and there's a lot of theater stuff happening uh, all the time, it seems like. Again, the pandemic has 
put a huge crimp in that, obviously. So it feels like nothing has happened recently, but it's you're starting to see more stuff bubbling up again, and you know people are going to live shows again and all of that. So uh, I've always I've always found the theatrical community in Regina to be very inclusive and, and a, a great uh, bunch of people to work and hang out with. Um, but why do we need theater in Regina? Live theater is not the same as recorded, even recorded theater. It's simply a different experience. And the only way you have live theater in a community is to make it happen in that community. Now, maybe you bring in a touring show, uh, but there's only so many of those. So if you're going to have it and have that experience, then it's going to be people within the community that, that do it. And it's... The thing about live theater is that it's more in-depth, I guess, because it's, you know, it's three-dimensional. Um, th these are actual living people right in front of you, and we react to that on a different level than we do just a film of somebody. And, uh, and then there's also the added thing that sometimes there's somebody you actually know, which is always exciting as well. But I think you need... You need live theater. You need theater in a community if you're going to have that experience of watching real, live, living people perform, and it's just different from any kind of recorded or streamed or non, non uh, live performance. Frances England passed away at the age of 95 in 2007, and she was an important figure to many Regina musicians. She was a piano teacher in the Crescent's neighborhood who taught hundreds of students over the years. Here's how actor and singer Marianne Woods remembers her. She taught, I think, well into her 80s and had a lot of really great students that came out of her studio and some went on to professional careers and some um, some just enjoyed the piano itself for the teaching and I I value that um, the time that I worked with her because it just helped me to read music and then I moved on to singing I was more interested in singing but because I learned so much from her I uh, I was able to continue music as part of my life yeah. you know so so I she and she was a great teacher and really well respected I mean the Lowe's lived right next door to her Don, Donna Lowe and uh, the Lowe family are just such a musical family and have you know gone on to great things yeah. but so it just seemed like the, a really cultural <laughs> street that she taught on you know so yeah. Yeah. yeah so I really valued her and and years later even after I stopped taking from her she was still so interested in what I was doing and you know the path that I was was on Dr. Susan McDonald is a Regina physician who also as a young person and then again as an adult took piano lessons from Miss England here's how Susan remembers her Um, she's a very, very slight woman. She was about 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, curly hair, glasses. She was Juilliard trained. She, she didn't end up performing because she had Dupuytren's contractures on both of her fifth, fourth and fifth fingers. But she could still stretch out and do 11 notes. Right. She could still play everything, but then her hand would go right back into that. Right. What was that called? Dupuytren's contractures. I don't know what that is. It's where the tendons get tightened up, and, and get, get it in people that do a lot of hand stuff. Okay. And in those days, in the 40s, plastic surgery wouldn't have been an option because it would have been too dangerous. Okay. So she had to give up her Juilliard performing career oh my God. and come home and teach. Plus, her brothers went to war around that time, so yeah. Right. So how old would she have been when that would have set in? Um... So she would have been in her 30s, I would think. Oh, my God. I think, yeah. 
she was really young to have it. But that's something that we can fix now? Yeah, you can fix it now. Now they have plastic surgery for it. Um, was she able to play at a lower level, though? Like, she could still play at ARCT level. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. She could still do it. We'd pl be playing a thing with huge chords, and she'd get them all. She'd be really quick at it. She'd kind of snatch at them, but she'd yeah. get them. Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing to watch her. What did it mean to have a teacher like her? Um, I actually wanted to start a year before I could because I was so excited about yeah. going to her. She, did, she taught my older brother, which is why my family got to know her. Frances England had a long history with Dark Hall. She performed there as part of the St. Cecilia Piano Club recital in April of 1929, just after the FN Dark Building for Music and Arts had opened. And as her performing career shifted to teaching, she held yearly recitals for her students in Dark Hall. I sat down with Susan MacDonald, and she recalled how those early experiences on the Dark Hall stage as a student of Francis England's contributed to her lifelong love of music. dance recital I did there. <laughs> Do you want to start there? Like, can you tell me about that dance recital? I think it was my second year of med school, actually. And I came home in the summer. Yeah, I came home in the summer and I'd been taking some ballet in med school. So yeah. I took a class from Reg Haw. And then he had a, a summer class from Reg Haw. And then he had his recital at the at Dark Hall. Like, how big of a class was that? I think there were, it was all adults. And I think there were about 15 of us in the class. That was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, can I ask, why were you doing dance while you're doing med school? Oh, I, I, I uh, taught Highland dance for years. Uh, yeah. So I took ballet because it was something I always wanted to do. But yeah. when I was growing up, my parents didn't have the, the car to take me to ballet and that kind of stuff. So Miss England was two blocks up the street. And then when I got older, I could go to the recital hall myself. Right. And um, I skated at West Canada Winter Club. So was that your first, that wasn't your first experience at Dark Hall? No, my first experience would have been with piano. I started piano when I was, I think, six. And I started taking from Frances England. So I would have taken at her house until about, until I was about 12. But mm -hmm. we had our recitals at Dark Hall. And then I switched to um, on campus at, at the Conservatory of Music for the rest of them. And I studied with her until I was 17. Nice. And then all our recitals were at Dark Hall. Uh, was she the only teacher who was doing that? Or were there a bunch of you who were I doing I think there were a bunch of teachers that did it. Yeah. But she had mm -hmm. it there every single year. What was it like being on that stage in that building as a young person playing piano? I, I don't ever remember it being scary, exciting huh? for sure. Francis would sit in the wings with a towel and before you went on stage, you'd have to towel off your hands so that they'd be dry for the piano. And we spent a lot of time, especially as a young kid, spent a lot of time near the end of the year learning how to bow and or curtsy properly and do all that kind of stuff. So she was Juilliard trained. So everything had to be just so. And it was great. What was she like as a person, like as a teacher? Uh, she's incredibly strict. Um, as a, as a kid, I was more afraid of her than I was of dark hall. Um, yes. not really afraid of her, but she was strict and I practiced a lot. So that got me through. Okay. She yeah. was, she's just very strict and, and you did it her way or the highway kind yeah. of thing, except once I backed off from that. Oh, what? Tell me about that. Oh, I was, I was supposed to play a grade eight Chopin, uh, for the festival one time. Yeah. And she called my parents and she said, I don't think Susan's ready to play in it. So they pulled me out. So the next year she tried the same thing with a Mozart piece. And I said, no, I'm playing in it anyway. And I ended up coming in second with it. Oh, right on. So, and then we drove her home and I got this stuff all the way home. Well, I guess you really practiced it up. And I thought, yeah, you phoned my parents last night and this is tonight. So I don't <laughs> think I did that much practice. I just didn't like the way I interpreted Mozart compared with how she interpreted Mozart. Do you remember like what composers you enjoyed performing the most? Um, well, Chopin, Mozart. Um, mm -hmm. I like some Brahms, a little bit of Tchaikovsky, Robert Schumann. I loved his stuff. Yeah, I guess it was a, I did a couple of Greed pieces. Oh, I did wow. one Debussy piece. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of everything. Yeah, and you were doing it for a long time. So that's like 11 years, you said? Yep. 
Yep. And then I kept playing. It's funny because um, I kept playing. And then when I was, I think I was about 33, I went back and started taking lessons with Frances again. And she was a whole different person when you weren't focused on exams and recitals and that kind of stuff. She became, so? a little, she's just much easier to deal with. She wasn't so picky. Yeah. I started out doing some scales and stuff. She said, oh no, you don't want to have to do that every day. So she gave me what she called a 20 minute workout. Right. She said, if you do that, you'll be able to play whatever classical piece you want. I really enjoyed the last two or three years I took with her, which was from about 33 to 35. Did you do any recitals at that time? Like when you were older? You know, that, that I don't remember. I think I maybe did one. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't do it all years because by that time I had four kids and I was practicing and yeah, I didn't yeah. have time to do it, but I think I did one with her. Yeah, I started back in about 20 years ago, I learned not that long, 10 years ago, maybe starting to learn some jazz piano with Arnie Davis. But right. um, then he he died and I've kind of let that go. But yeah, right. But it, it transitioned into a lot of things like a lot of choir work, a lot of singing, that kind of stuff. And because you know the music and you can read it, it sure does. It's a great foundation. My four kids all have the same foundation. <laughs> Music has stayed with you through your life, even though you've taken a really d- a different uh, career path. Yeah, you bet it has. How do you think that performance back? Well, not even the performance background, but just music itself has like enriched your life. Um, well, it gives you an outlet. Uh, it gives me lots of outlets now with different choirs. Um, I still like to play, although my playing really sucks. Miss England would be rolling in her grave, yeah. but I still I still have a piano and I still play. And um, I, my best friend did Leanne Laville. She's the one I, I, I really grew up with, with Miss England. We've stayed lifelong friends because of meeting together to play a duet. That simple thing there. We've been friends for over 50 years now. It's, and and I, I, tell you, I, I played for our choir in high school. I sang with our choir in high school, and then I played for our choir in high school for two years. I played different churches. Um, for Sunday mass, that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's it, music is super important <laughs> that way. So just about your experiences of Dark Hall, what was it like just sort of inhabiting the building as a, you know, as a young performer? Like, what was it like in there? Um, the, the most fun part was running through the tunnels, I have to admit, um, because not, probably not when I was really young, because I would have been closer to the family. But when I got to be 12, 13, you know, we'd, we'd watch the other performers because you were, as you got older, you were later in the program. Yeah. So watch the other performers. And Leanne and I would look at each other and go, let's go back and do a practice. Yeah. And we'd run through the tunnels and go back to our studio and we'd practice and we'd run back through the tunnels. And yeah, I think we both had a touch of ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then the, the neat part, like it was really fun to be up on that stage. It, it gave you stage presence. It gave you confidence. You know, it, it just... Uh, it just gave you a confidence that you could get up and perform in front of people. And if, if you messed it up a little bit, you could then keep going and get up and do your bow. And um, I'm, I think memorizing pieces was so important, yeah. which I, I've seen recitals nowadays. Most of the teachers don't make their kids memorize. And I yep. think that's a great disservice to them. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. You're listening to Out of the Dark, a series about Regina's historic performance space, Dark Hall, on 91.3 FM CJTR, tuned into the community. The best part was going down underneath after for the reception, because everything would be on china and silver plates, little sandwiches. Miss England always bought those um, little ice cream sundaes with a wooden spoon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Had a couple of huge trays with those on them for our students, and everybody was dressed to the nines. And we'd go down into the basement, and it'd be a beautiful reception. Was that the basement under Dark Hall, or was it over yeah. in the conservatory? No, it was the basement under Dark Hall. What did it look like in that in the basement there? Um, it, there was just a whole bunch of doors for practice areas, right? And then it was like one great big open room with a bunch of doors along each side for a practice area. Right. And then I think there was a kitchen at the back of it, like a kitchen right. at the back of it. You mentioned that like people dressed to the nines, like things 
back in those days, it, going to a place, a space like Dark Hall was, oh. it was like a reverence to it that we may not have nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't wear jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> That's for <laughs> sure. I always pick out your recital dress and dad have a suit on. Mom would have a nice dress on. My brothers, all three of them had suits. My older brother also played in Miss England's recitals. Um, yeah. Younger two didn't, but uh, yeah, or the other two didn't. Right. But yeah, everybody would be dressed up. It was just like going to church. It was, you know, you dressed up nicely. What about your experience as an audience member? Like, what was it as a, you know, back in those days? What was, well, not even those days, just like in general, as a space to experience theater or music, what was it? What was it like? The acoustics are incredible there. Um, yeah. yeah, back then it was. And I don't know, it was just, it was like going to the Capitol Theater when the Capitol Theater was oh. at its prime, you know? <laughs> Yeah. There's nothing these days that compares to it. Even the center of the arts, it's a beautiful space, but it doesn't have the old architecture and that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Why do you think that's important? Like, wh why does that, why does that resonate and have meaning for, for you? And wh why would you, how would you express that? I think it just has a sense of tradition that yeah. newer places don't have. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, I guess where I wanted to sort of like start wrapping things up with is uh, what does what does a space like Dark Hall uh, mean to you and why do you think it's important to a city to have places like this? It's a tradition in Regina. Yeah. And I think it's important that people recognize those traditions and, and, and enjoy them. You know? okay. um, yeah, I think it's a main thing. It would be a nice place to keep as a community space because um, even if you're playing something from Keyboard Town your very first year, you felt so special getting up on that stage in that space doing it. I know my kids went through some piano when they were younger and they did it in churches and that kind of stuff. And it was just not the same as getting up on Dark Hall and walking across that stage to the grand piano and doing it there. Just not the same as what I had. When the uh, renovation was announced, uh, there were, well, restoration, there were some people in Regina who were pretty concerned that uh, this would go awry and we would wind up with either a demolition or uh, a gross modernization. Um, when you heard that Dark Hall was being uh, renovated, uh, how did you feel? Um, to be honest, I wasn't even all that aware of it because mm -hmm. I was just in the process of moving back into the city myself. Right. So it wasn't really, yeah. So the first time I was on campus after some of the renovations, I went to a bagpipe thing in the conservatory and it was just gorgeous. Once I saw that, I have no problems with them renovating it. They did such yeah. a beautiful job on that one. Do you have any like hopes? Like, do you, like if, if you are thinking about Dark Hall, like, do you have hopes for how it will turn out? Um, no, not really. I just hope they, they keep enough of the, what it was originally. Yeah. So it, it, it kind of brings the new and the old together. I think the last time I was in Dark Hall itself was for my granddaughter's, uh, uh fiddle, fiddle recital. And it was kind of neat to be back there watching my granddaughter do a fiddle recital when I had started there, you know, at a similar age. <laughs> yeah. What did she play? I don't remember exactly what she played. She played with a group. And right. She was in with, I think it was a Zuki method. And it was the last year she played with uh, that, that group. I can, that's gotta be pretty amazing to be in a building like that, watching like your grandchildren. Yeah. Perform up there, right? Yeah, it was neat. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that's how my parents felt when, you know, my parents and everybody else, when we were up there performing. <laughs> Sherry Torgrimson is a teacher, translator, musician, and poet who was a music education student at the University of Regina in the 1980s, and she spent many hours practicing and taking classes in Dark Hall. Sherry lives and works in Poland now, and she sent us a poem reflecting upon her time as a student in Dark Hall. Our Dark Hall by Sherry Torgrimson Drawing out memories, faint and far away, 
like notes floating through the hall from a practice room. Try to catch them and hold them in your hands. They are prairie snowflakes. Neither the notes nor the memories want to be caught. They dance through my fingers, slipping away as if they were fragments of a dream. But remember, we must. It is who we are, where we came from, lest we forget. A second home, this place. Here we made notes on pages sing, while the hallway rang with everything from scales to concertos, rarely a dull note. Hours spent in small rooms, coming out for air and fellowship, clustering together in our space. Rehearsals on the stage of the hall, so dark, an apt name indeed. A building of music, drama, art, and creation, where communities drew together to listen. You were old and a bit shabby in the light, but like a woman of uncertain age, maintain some of your beauty from earlier days. A truer picture of your age showed in the Saskatchewan winter when we walked the tunnel, lit and warm, but dusty and crumbling. No matter, we had history, architecture and atmosphere in a place to call our own. Now you have regained your youth and while we may marvel at your new visage, your middle age is what will live on in our memories, our youth. Huge thanks to Edward Willett, Susan McDonald, and Sherry Torgumson for sharing their memories of Dark Hall. You've been listening to Out of the Dark, an exploration of Dark Hall through stories. This series was made possible thanks to the generous support of Sask Arts and the University of Regina Conservatory of Performing Arts. Dark Hall is situated in Treaty 4 territory, the traditional home of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Makeshift Nation. Music for Out of the Dark is from Mozart's Dissonance Quartet, 465, and performed by Christian Robinson and Hang Han Ho on violins, Jonathan Ward on viola, and Simon Fryer on cello. They are Regina Symphony Orchestra performers. I'm your host, Paul Deshane. Thank you for listening. <laughs>